and who wrote a blog post called Three Cheers for White Men. According to a large number of medievalists and other academics, this post was so dangerous in its presumed ability to spread heteropatriarchal and white supremacist harm that the person who wrote it has had to be chastised, called out as a white supremacist, and preferably fired from her academic position. And that's my subject on today's Fiamingo File. I'm Janice Fiamingo of the University of Ottawa. Like many other academic fields today, medieval studies has been rocked by claims that white supremacism and other far-right isms are deeply embedded in the discipline and must be rooted out. In fact, that there is nothing more important to do in the field than talk about white supremacism and hetero heteropatriarchy and that anyone not willing to do that must themselves be white supremacists whose denials or even silence harm people of color. According to the self-anointed leaders of the social justice movement in academia, what is necessary now is the hiring, promotion, and, quote, centering of people of color. Also necessary are explicit declarations on the part of every academic of their abhorrence of whiteness and their declared commitment to center the voices and experiences of people of color. And furthermore, there must be an enthusiastic take no prisoners hunting down, not only of alleged white supremacists, but of anyone who fails to make the necessary anti-white noises. In a timorous academic culture, very few fail to fall in line with the luminous exception of dissident academic Rachel Fulton Brown, a professor of medieval history at the University of Chicago, author of a number of well-received academic books, as well as a committed Catholic, an enthusiastic blogger, a lover of Western civilization and its Christian underpinnings, a self-described entish intellectual, a defender and friend of Milo Yiannopoulos and quite possibly the boldest non-conformist in all of academia at the present time. And for that, not surprisingly, Rachel Fulton Brown has been under attack for more than two years and has provoked near apoplectic rage and an extraordinary level of verbal viciousness from her fellow academics across the world for her refusal to recruit medieval studies for the social justice cause. Fulton Brown has consistently argued that claims about white supremacy and misogyny have really very little to do with the reality of the medieval period and seem designed mainly to taint the whole past of Western culture, which she claims deserves our respect and even our celebration, as is evident in the title of the blog post that started all the fuss. Three cheers for white men. Here Fulton Brown dared to defend Western Christendom as the source of many of our most cherished values of gender equality and respect for individual worth. She ended that little post by advising readers to, quote, hug a white man today. This led Dr. Rohit Chopra, an associate professor of communications at Santa Clara University, to tweet with indignation that, quote, the ugliest thing on academic social media now is white conservative academic Rachel Fulton Brown defending the greatness of white men, end quote. How dare she? Fulton Brown has also crossed the line into unacceptable conduct by writing many blog posts, one that ended up being published in Breitbart magazine, defending Milo Yiannopoulos against detractors' claims about him. And for that, she is now regularly labeled as by uh, Nadir Firat, who is a lecturer at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore as a, quote, fascist white supremacist professor, end quote. The far-left social justice academic crowd is so used to fawning obedience from their peers that they become irrationally enraged by any opposition, no matter how cheerful and gracious as Fulton Brown's has been. And, and I strongly, urged any, strongly urge 
anyone who's at all interested in this case, because I can't tell you all the details, to read Fulton Brown's blog posts, as I've done, and, and to see the degree of self-restraint, the degree of generosity and lightness of spirit, as well as the intellectual heft that she has brought to what has turned into a really ugly, one-sided mobbing. Academics have set out to destroy this woman professionally, and they have done it with remarkable single-mindedness and sometimes vulgarity. For example, Joshua Clover, a communist poet, theorist of the riot as cultural expression, and radical professor of English at the University of California at Davis, has tweeted that, quote, it would be in the interest of the movement to rid medieval studies of its own tacit enablers of ethno-nationalisms and its own actual racists, such as Rachel Fulton Brown, end quote. He didn't say how Professor Fulton Brown should be got rid of, and one can only imagine his reaction if someone suggested that all third-rate communist poet propagandists should be got rid of. Across the continent, Carl Steele, an associate professor of English at Brooklyn College at the City University of New York, tweeted that, quote, there's hooking a wagon to a star, and then there's Rachel Fulton Brown, who's hooked her dung cart to Milo's asshole, end quote. Well, thank you, Professor Steele, for showing off your cultivated wit to the whole world. Now, what specifically did Fulton Brown do to cause all this outrage. Milo Yiannopoulos has written a fantastic article outlining the scandal in detail, which I encourage you to read, but in brief. In January of 2016, it was called to Fulton Brown's attention that a junior scholar named Dorothy Kim had seized on the Three Cheers for White Men blog post and denounced it as an example of, quote, white feminism that was engaged in, quote, upholding white supremacism and something called military machines. Kim issued a dramatic and, I think, rather febrile challenge to Fulton Brown and anybody else who might cheer the achievements of white men. You'd better disavow the appropriation of the medieval period for white supremacy or accept that you are a white supremacist whose academic work empowers the war machine. She wrote, quote, If medievalists imagine that their work is not political or not going to be used in contemporary war machines, then medievalists must consider what privilege they have to dodge this. The idea that this can be separated away from the current now is a privilege of whiteness, a privilege of heteropatriarchy, end quote. In various other Facebook posts and then in a Medieval Studies blog post, Dorothy Kim continued to attack Rachel Fulton Brown as a white supremacist and Nazi and continued to claim that anyone who taught Medieval Studies neutrally or even positively as the root of much of that is good in Western culture was promoting white supremacism and acting as what she called, quote, an ideological arms dealer, end quote. And she said in the post, quote, teaching medieval studies in a time of white supremacism, here are her words. So, are you going to be apathetic weapons dealers, not caring how your material and tools will be used? Do you care who your buyers are in the classroom? Choose a side. Doing nothing is choosing a side. Denial is choosing a side, end quote. Now, when Fulton Brown repeatedly responded to clarify that she was not a white supremacist and that she rejected Kim's description of the medieval period and how it can be used to support white supremacy, her response was inter interpreted by Kim and by Kim's various defenders as not only a statement of Fulton Brown's inadequate understanding of racial theory, but also as an action that endangered Dorothy Kim always conveniently forgetting, of course, that it had been Kim who had unpersoned Fulton Brown by repeatedly, repeatedly calling her a white supremacist. From here, things snowballed. Dorothy Kim complained about Fulton Brown's so-called attacks on her, stating at one point that as a person of color, her, that's Rachel Fulton Brown's, views are violence to me. And more and more professors eagerly declared their solidarity with Kim and their abhorrence of Fulton Brown's supposed aggression. 
Twitter came alive with statements such as that by Leela K. Norako, who is an assistant professor in the Department of English at the University of Washington, claiming to be, quote, appalled by Rachel Fulton Brown's attacks on Dorothy Kim. Our field, she said, is worlds better for Dorothy's presence in it, and I stand with her, end quote. I'm always impressed by how very brave English professors are when there's absolutely no risk to them in standing with somebody. Almost no one has stood with Rachel Fulton Brown. Pretty soon, the gathering mob got the idea of writing an open letter to the history department at the University of Chicago to complain about Fulton Brown and to state that she was a disgrace to the department and had caused harm to a vulnerable woman and to people of color in general. And at least 1,300 academics, probably more now, have signed this letter. Amongst other things, the letter claimed that, quote, while tenets of academic freedom dictate that Professor Fulton Brown is allowed to express any opinion she wishes, we do not believe that doing so in a manner that puts an untenured, untenured scholar of color or any scholar in harm's way is her right. And while again, she is allowed <laughs> to say what she likes. Her ignorance of basic theoretical principles of race theory renders her an ill-informed and substandard interlocutor in the rigorous scholarly discussion of this important subject. To say the very least, her highly public statement reflects poorly on your department." End quote. The letter, well, it could have been written by a social justice computer program rather than by any living, breathing persons. So entirely hackneyed are its various claims. And it's astonishing to me that so-called intellectuals can't come up with anything more coherent than the argument that Fulton Brown has a right to freedom of speech, but not a right to freedom of speech when it harms somebody. But how had Fulton Brown endangered Dorothy Kim? Supposedly by including her picture in one of her, Rachel Fulton Brown's, blog posts. But this is a picture that is widely available on the internet and that Kim herself included with her blog posts. The letter writers don't even try to say how anything Fulton Brown has stated could possibly be taken as a call to violence, even an implicit one although one certainly could argue that the repeated declarations that medieval studies needs to rid itself of white supremacist fascists like Rachel Fulton Brown could logically be taken, especially by academics who glorify punching Nazis as a call to violence. Well, obviously the intent of the open letter was to have Fulton Brown fired or failing that, at least to have her disciplined or given a talking to by her department members eager to display their own progressivist bona fides. But so far that hasn't happened. At the same time, the department has done nothing to support Rachel Fulton Brown other than to issue a very vaguely worded general letter saying that she's free to express her views and that they neither endorse nor condemn her. And they deplore hate speech and they fail to distinguish between Fulton Brown's civil statements and the uncivil statements of her attackers, and they end with an expression of commitment to fostering, quote, an inclusive and diverse, end quote, academic environment. So while not exactly throwing Fulton Brown under the proverbial bus, her colleagues are certainly keeping a wary distance. They don't want to find themselves labeled white supremacist enablers. Fulton Brown continues to respond to her attackers with civility and courtesy. And again, I encourage anyone interested to read through her many blog posts to see the, the self-restraint and the good cheer with which she has handled their attacks. Why is Rachel Fulton Brown so hated? She's hated because she loves the history of Western civilization, particularly its Christian roots, at a time when cultural self-hatred on the part of white academics is a sine qua non of respectability. She's hated because she professes a biblical concept of virtue and everyone else is madly virtue signaling. I, I stole that idea from her. And she's hated because she's utterly impervious as far as any outsider can tell to attempts at intimidation. And Rachel Fulton Brown's independence of mind exposes the majority of academics for the pusillanimous time servers enslaved to fashion and to group think that so many are. My advice to Fulton Brown's detractors, 
You should stop trying to humiliate this woman with your bullying and tweeting and your ridiculous open letters. It's not a good look for you. At best, you come off like heretic hunter.